Hi, everybody. Uh, this is John, of course. Uh, I'm not sure why I introduce each video with my name. I, I think you probably got that by now. So just just force of habit, I guess. So I apologize for that. Uh, so this week we are entering into module five. Uh, believe it or not, we are cruising right through this class and through the material. Uh, you're all doing a great job. So um, I appreciate the engagement. I appreciate the discussion. This is a very engaged class. Um, so just keep keep it going. We're we're halfway halfway through. So um, I, look, I, to recap last week, um, like, like I mentioned last week, that that was my favorite discussion question because it really forces you to to think through um, the the problem that's presented to you in a in a very analytical manner so you're presented with uh a scenario uh really two scenarios in which you're asked if if uh if there was a breach and um if you thought through that um analytically then you employed the the iraq method of legal analysis so uh, remember i talked about my sophomore physics class where the professor said hey you got the formulas formulas there you just you throw in the values, throw in the, the numbers and turn the crank and you come out with your conclusion. So a very similar process here. Obviously, we're not dealing with numbers, but we, we've got our formula. The formula is the Iraq method of legal analysis. You, you got your issue, identify your issue, identify your rule, apply the rule to the facts that are given to you. So it's important to know specific facts because the, the key to a, a really valuable and in-depth great legal analysis is the use of specific facts. And then, then you come out with your conclusion. Remember, not interested in right or wrong answers when it comes to legal analysis. I'm interested in, in the analysis itself. I think that's a, a skill that will serve you well beyond this class, obviously. Um, so that that's what we're really, really interested in and, and tied into in this class. So um yeah so so the rule is in the definition of breach what is a breach well it's it's defined by regulation and it, it, it requires you to consider some factors um it requires you to consider some exceptions do any of those exceptions apply that's the rule apply the facts to that rule and then come out with, with your conclusion is this a breach or not so um you know any, any uh hipaa policy for any healthcare provider will uh will will require a risk analysis uh, if, if a security incident occurs so if there's a if there's some evidence or some something that indicates that there may be a breach well it requires the provider to go through this analysis and and really think through those factors that are in the rule um and and think through those exceptions do any of those exceptions apply to really come out with a determination of whether there's a breach or not. And, you know, if there's an investigation by the OCR, they're going to ask for that analysis. They, they want to see how the provider arrived at their determination and how uh, how that analysis was conducted. So uh, it's important to, to really think through that analytically. Uh, this week, I'm, I'm going to go through some material in this video that isn't necessarily covered in any discussion question. Um, but you know, this is, this is, this class is on healthcare legal and ethical considerations. And, um, you know, we're largely talking about medical negligence, but health law goes well beyond medical negligence. And I actually deal with, I don't deal with medical negligence very much. And I'm a healthcare lawyer. I, I really deal in the economics of healthcare and the business of healthcare, the regulatory side. Of, of healthcare. And so I wanted to touch upon that a little bit this week, just, just uh, to be comprehensive <laughs> and to be true to the title of, the, of this course. Um, and I, and I think it's interesting, but it's, I know many people don't. So my kids, I think I've said before, my kids think I have the most boring job in the world and some days they're right, but um, that's okay. That's okay. It's, we all have our own, uh, things that we do and it interests some and it doesn't interest others. So that's okay. Uh, I want to talk about the economics of healthcare a little bit. Uh, is, this is always a big topic of discussion, especially in a, an election year. 
Um, how will we fund healthcare? How will we deliver healthcare? Well, right now, uh, there, you know, we can really separate, I think, payers of healthcare or insur insurers into two different categories. There's their private health insurers, and this would be your employer group health plans, your self funded uh, employer plans, which are ERISA plans, and, and your healthcare exchange plans. So if you're self employed, for example, you can purchase a policy on the on the uh, on the market, the healthcare market, the exchange, which is a product of the Affordable Care Act. Um, then the second category I, I would I would uh, define as government plans. So this would be like your Medicare, right? Um, Medicaid, uh, Medicare Advantage, which is Medicare Part C. It's a product of Medicare. Uh, managed care, managed Medicaid, uh, Medicare Advantage is really just managed care at, at the Medicare level. And then other government plans like TRICARE for military or uh, the Federal Employee Benefits Health Plan for federal employees. And, and, there, and there are others, but those, those are the main ones. Now, the, the, the importance of uh, really separating those two is uh, you know, if you're a healthcare provider and you're dealing with, you're a Medicare provi enrolled provider or Medicaid or in any of these other healthcare plans, uh, it, it subjects you to other laws that you wouldn't be subject to if you're just dealing in private insurance. And so, for example, the anti-kickback statute, which is a federal criminal law, um, the False Claims Act, the uh, Stark Law for Physicians, um, so the uh, uh, Medicare, Medicaid beneficiary inducement law, these are all federal laws that you're subject to as a healthcare provider. And, and, and you don't have to be a healthcare provider. So for example, anti-kickback statute applies to anybody, but it applies to federal healthcare programs. Um, so that not, no, that's not to say that th there aren't state laws. So the state laws may have a, a state anti-kickback statute or a state false claims act that would apply to private insurance but we're just talking about federal law um, government program subjects you to federal laws that you otherwise wouldn't be subject to if you were just dealing in private insurance um, and then you have other ways things like uh, uh, accountable care organizations which is a product of, of uh, medicare is medicare share savings plans population health and integrated care um, and th th that's, that's just important to know. So I, w I'll get into a couple of those federal laws here in a minute. But, you know, the, when we talk about the business of healthcare, um, there are a few things to, to think about. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it really is a, is a business. Um, and uh, the first thing I think about when, when I think about the business of healthcare is the corporate practice of medicine doctrine. And, and it's a it's a state law that some states have and some states don't that says only physicians can practice medicine now you might think john that's the most obvious thing you've ever said um but what it does is it prohibits corporations or llcs from employing uh doctors so you can't have uh your kroger grocery store actually employ a doctor to provide medical services it, it would prohibit that and the, the the theory behind it is that they don't want someone who, uh, an employer that does not practice medicine, is not in the business of medicine, to affect the judgment of a an employee physician, the, the professional medical judgment of the employee physician. So some states say you just can't do that. So you can have a professional corporation that's owned by licensed physicians, and that's it. Uh, now, there are certainly ways around that. And if you're interested, give me a call or shoot me a text, and I'd be happy to go through how to get around uh, that. Um, and a very common, um, very common uh, structural organizational models to get around this, this corporate practice of medicine doctrine um, that are utilized quite frequently in states that adhere to it. So, uh, but that's... Um, uh, that that would take too long for this video. So, uh, but I'm always happy to discuss it. So, if you're interested, just let me know. Um, uh, you know, other other things with business of healthcare. You know, a medical group uh, often will either be employed by a hospital or they'll contract with a hospital. 
uh, they'll pro to provide clinical services and they'll contract with insurers to be in their network. And, you know, that this is a really complicated area that, you know, a health plan can lease networks, can, um, can just contract with networks and to create a network that are narrow networks, which are more common now to save on healthcare costs. Um, uh, you know, like, and like I said, or the physicians can be directly employed by the hospitals, which, um, we're seeing more and more today. So, um, in terms of regulatory laws, uh, you know, on the, on the federal side, which is really all we're going to get into because state laws can vary. Um, some state laws have referral, uh, anti-referral self-referral laws. Some don't, some just rely on the federal law for that. Uh, it just, it varies. So we won't even get into it, but there are two federal laws that I want to talk about real quick. One is the anti-kickback statute. Like I said, it was a, it, it's a criminal law, but there's also a civil monetary component to it where you can be assessed some significant fines. But uh, it really, the anti-kickback statute says that <clears throat> nobody can receive, offer, give, provide, um, solicit anything of value in exchange for patient referrals uh, that are paid for by a federal health care program. So in its most simple form, that, and now it, this can get really complicated, in its most simple form, uh, and, and I, this is dangerously oversimplifying it, but, um, you know, it, it would prohibit me from saying, all right, Hey doctor, I'm going to, uh, um, if you give me, you know, 10% of your earnings, uh, I'll, I'll feed you patient referrals, right? So if you give me 10% of what you get paid for providing services to those patients, then, then we have a deal that's that's really illegal. So um, yeah, as long as if those patients are enrolled in federal health care programs, that's illegal at the federal level. So this, and of course, the, the kickbacks can come in a variety. It's not usually, it's usually not uh, just a cash exchange. Like I, like I said, it was, I was really oversimplifying it. It, the, it could be anything of value, any benefit, any remuneration um, in exchange for patient referrals that are paid for by a federal health care program. The second one is a stark law and it just apply it just applies to medicare and it just applies to physicians so it prohibits physicians from <clears throat> referring patients for certain only certain limited designated healthcare services uh referring patients to a facility <clears throat> for a for one of those services in which that physician has uh has a uh, a, a financial interest in so um if let, let's say, for example, the physician, a physician uh, owns a diagnostic imaging center, well, it would prohibit that physician from referring or has an ownership interest in the diagnostic imaging center. It would prohibit that physician from referring patients to the to that center because he or she is going to benefit financially from that. Right. Um, of course, there are exceptions to, to that, like everything. And and uh, and so one of one of those exceptions would have to apply in order for that to happen. Um, it's not just ownership interest; it can be a compensation arrangement. So, uh, for example, <clears throat> um, a hospital employing a physician, um, and a physician provides services to patients for for the hospital. The physician is referring services to the hospital. Technically, under that plain language of the Stark Law, that would violate Stark. But there's an exception that applies. It's called the bona fide employment relationship exception. So, as long as as long as uh, the hospital empl is employing the physician, that employment arrangement meets certain requirements, then there is no Stark violation. So it really is. It's designed to uh, obviously um, protect patients. Um, you know, maybe. Uh, the referral to that physician's diagnostic Im imaging center is not in the best interest of the patient uh, because it's, and it's just being done to to put more cash in the physician's pocket. And it's also designed to prevent overutilization of the Medicare program. <clears throat> so um, so anyways, that's uh, hopefully I didn't put you to sleep. And if I did, it's time to wake up. Um, but uh, I just wanted to really sort of dive into and give you a taste of the economics of healthcare, some of the regulatory issues 
surrounding the business of healthcare and some of the things that, that we deal with in the, in the healthcare industry uh, that aren't necessarily transparent to or uh, are visible to patients. Um, but anyways, uh, I hope you have a great week. Uh, you guys are doing great. Uh, keep up the great engagement and great discussion. And as always, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Have a good one.